Okay, so attributes. Okay, I can probably comment all this stuff out because we don't need it. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, so here's the zoning data set that we all know and love. Just went ahead and loaded it as we have. I've clipped it to the river. I think you guys worked with this. Okay, so get num features. It's going to return the number of features in the file. Boom. 2,700 odd ones. Set up an index equal to zero. While index less than num features. So we're going to loop through all the features. Then we're going to go ahead and get the zoning value with an index. Boom. There's the value. Ah, the wonderful zoning codes from Humble County. Okay, now notice what we've got. We've got if the value is equals equals none or the value dot find TPZ is equals equals negative one. Okay, so this is called a Boolean expression. <clears throat> Don't freak out when you see these. Um, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit to make it a little clearer. So we say something like TPZ index equals that. Okay. Say that. So we can then say if the value is none, so if it's none, it's not going to have TPZ in it, or the TPZ index is negative one. Okay. So basically, in either case, it doesn't have TPZ in it else go ahead and move to the next one so all this code does and this is from melody is delete the features that don't have tpz in them and then if we delete a feature we need to subtract one from our number of features because the number of features is shrunk and we don't want to be in our loop forever okay so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all this other stuff because it's doing a whole bunch of other things that we don't need. Okay, so we go through, I'm gonna open up stack data. Highly recommend get used to, to using breakpoints, get used to using stack data. We can see our value is this weird AE600 thing. It does not have TPZ in it. So this is gonna be a negative one if the value is equal to none, which it's not, or TPZ index is equals equals negative one. This is true, so it's gonna go in here it's going to delete that feature and we're going to decrement or take one off of our number of features. Then we're going to get another one, another one, another one, another one. And we go on for a long time. Programming is wonderful. If I want to see one with TPZ in it, I can do a breakpoint there and then just hit go. Oh, oh. Now we've got a value that has TPZ in it and it went into here. And now we're going to move on to the next feature. There's another TPZ and a whole bunch of TPZs. And you can see our number of features dropping. And if I just let it go, oops. Oh, we got a none value for zoning. Huh. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, that's why this had to be inside of here. Got it. Because we need to test for it to be none first. And then if it's not none, if this is false, it'll test this. Otherwise, it'll stop. More on that later. Okay, and then we out that and you can see that we've cut it down to only 657 features 
all of which have TPZ in them. Now, since I used find, it could be TPZ and other zoning attributes, right? It could be that it's timber production and residential or timber production and industrial. So it could have other zoning things in it. Cool. Questions? No questions. Okay. So um, the material on the website and in the videos um, does go into how to use selections as well. And you can use selections. Um, and I, th there's no problem using selections. There's always multiple ways to solve programming problems. Um, in my experience, these if statements are just much more flexible right? And you can just change whatever you want. I mean, you could go in here and say, well, I want to look at areas where the zoning is TPZ and the area is over 5,000 acres. And in the future, we can get into, well, I want to find the, the timber, you know, that's within, uh, that's zoned as TPZ, that is also residential, and that's within 50 feet of a river. And so this is where we can get into very complex analysis really quickly with Python and solve just about any problem out there. Things that you can't do just in a GIS, okay? Um, the other one I was gonna mention, and there's a big yellow block in the website um, because I've seen students struggle with this every year, is when you're doing your programming, start with small data sets, right? And also, as you go through Python, you know, one of the first things you wanna do is if you've got a big data set, clip it to your area of interest. Okay, and the future when we're doing batch processing, we'll actually take big rasters, big data sets, and we'll cut them into chunks, and we'll process each chunk individually, because that's not only faster, but there's some cases like uh, just recently, Kristen, another student, she sent me a link for a one meter topobathy, so it's a dam and bathymetry for the Northern California coast. It's a 60 gigabyte file. <laughs> so I literally can't load it into memory in Python. And, and what we need to do with it is break it into pieces. And then we'll load pieces of it because we literally can't get the whole thing into RAM to work on in one shot. So that idea of cutting up your spatial data to work on it in pieces is really important, both to get you up to speed more quickly so you're not waiting for stuff, but also down the road so we can literally Otherwise, we won't be able to work on some data sets. They're just too big. And that's becoming more and more common um, because the data sets are getting bigger, the problems are getting bigger, and the resolution, especially with the raster data, is getting higher. We're, we're going to get one meter LIDAR for all of California within the next few years. That's going to be a cool data set. And it'll be like 500 gig of data. How do you decide? Um how you would break up such a large file? Uh, it's hard. Um, and particularly like in this case, usually it's fairly straightforward because rasters are usually pretty rectangular. And so what you do is um, ARC doesn't really like working with data that's more than a couple hundred megabytes at a time. 500 meg, it starts crashing and breaking. So I usually tell students 200 and I'll go a little bit above that, three or 400, but I don't go over that. So you just break it into rectangular areas that are under 500 megabytes. Usually, like I said, 200 meg, that's a good chunk size to work with. In this case, the data is in this strip, right? It's Northern California bathymetry. And, and I tried to do all of Humboldt Bay and the O River Delta, basically the area I was interested in. And that ended up being too big. So now I've got to cut it up and now I've got a Northern Humboldt Bay and a Southern Humboldt Bay and an Eel River estuary. And it's kind of clunky, right? It's not as nice as if we at least could do all of Humboldt Bay. So it's a challenge at times and you just have to look at what's too big a file 
right? And then how do you get it to work correctly? And often we'll do bigger files, like these are ended up being multi gigabyte files. And I'll put that up for people to download. And then when I download it, I'll cut it up into smaller pieces to process it. And we can do that in Python. Python can cut these up. And also it helps to have a computer with 30 gig of RAM. This one has 30 gig, my new computer. Remember the days when we had 256K? Oh, where's my computer? I'll have to bring my computer home. I still have my first computer. My first computer had 8K of RAM. And, and I added eight more K with a little board that you could add to it. It was pretty cool. It could do 16 K of RAM. You get some old guy stories in this class. I've been doing this for a while. We started with computers that were on slate with chalk, you know. All right, questions? Are you guys making progress on the assignments? Slowly and surely. Okay, make sure to hit it. Hit it hard, um, you know, before, some, before the uh, weekend, because I pay attention to email much better now than I do on the weekend. Um, Sundays, I will check in. Saturdays, sometimes I take off and I don't see email all day. Okay. And we do have a TA now, Judd, but he hasn't taken this class. So if someone here is, thinks Python is easy and is bored, let me know if you want a TA, because we need a TA out of this class. Questions? Sort of a follow-up question to um, the question that um, Jennifer brought up at the beginning of class with the SpotPy library. So do you recommend just pasting it, repasting it into every um, lab folder or where would you recommend having it so that it can find it every time without doing that? Well, so you remember I mentioned having a couple students work on SpotPy? Yeah. <laughs> So up until this semester, we were only running SpotPy the way that I just, the way Jennifer did, it, by putting it in the same folder as your script. Because we hadn't figured out how to make it into a wheel file and have it run through PIP. Literally, none of the students had done that. So over break, um, Melody, with help from Mason, one of our um, IT guys, Mason Long, who's a great IT guy, he just one day sent us the, the code and the setup for how to turn it into a wheel file. And then Melody ran that and figured out a whole bunch of detailed things about how to make that work. And eventually we can add it to the python.org website. So people can just type pip install spotify and it'll download it and install it. Um, but we've been working on it for three years and it's still a little rough around the edges. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting much better. The fact that you guys didn't riot this sec, you know, this last week is an indication that, it, that it's doing pretty well. Um, but it still has problems. And I just fixed a bunch of stuff, like I said. So that's why next week or the week after, I have to keep the assignment straight because I'm working on the raster one. Week after next, you'll all be putting it in the same folder as your script because I don't want to harass Brent and have him roll it again in the middle of the semester. And that could cause other problems. So we'll be doing that for the raster stuff because it's working better now. And I added some new features that will make it easier to debug raster stuff. So the reason it's important though, is because like I said, getting libraries to work is the big problem with Python. So it's also a trick, right? If you can't get a library to install, which happens on a regular basis, some of them you can just stick in the same folder and you're off and running. So there's about five different ways to install libraries with Python. The normal default one is pip, and pip is working much better. But there's other ways. <laughs> and it, it's not pretty. It's, it's a mess. And the cool part is, and again, Mason and Brent helped us with something called a virtual machine. So down the road, we'll also show you how to set up your own virtual machine for Python which allows you to set up your own libraries. So those of you doing projects, in the past, we couldn't customize the libraries on the HSU machines because everybody's using the same install of Python. 
Well, they figured out how to do a virtual Python environment, so you guys will be able to do your own libraries. Now, you're still going to have advantages if you have it on your own personal computer because you can customize it to your heart's content. But the virtual machines will actually allow you to customize a Python install on our virtual servers, which is also pretty cool. And I've been using it to test builds. So you can literally install Python inside a folder, install a bunch of libraries with it, and then you just delete it. And then you can do it again. And that's how we've been testing like SpotPy with different versions of Python and things like, and different versions of GDAL and Fiona. And, uh, it's more fun than it sounds like. Not, not really. <laughs> Libraries are kind of a pain, but they're really cool when you see people use them and they work well. Anyway, questions? Okay. I was hoping you guys have time to do some coding, but I'm guessing that a number of you have been coding while you're sitting here on uh, listening, and that is just fine. I don't have a problem at all. At all. Um, I think I told you, you know, I've taken programming classes where they lectured, and I just thought that was really weird. It's like going to a lecture to learn how to ride a bike. I, it's weird, right? You need, to, you need to program to learn to program. So that's what these sessions are for. These are more like lab sessions. All right. And if no one has any other questions or things you want me to clarify, we can actually be done at 10 till, which is our official time to be done. This doesn't happen very often in the virtual world. <laughs> Good luck getting anything with 16K. Hey, back then 16K was a lot. And it was all uh, basic or assembly. At some point when I want to tease you guys, I'll show you what assembly code looks like. It's computers actually don't execute Python directly. They execute in what's called machine code. You guys have seen the matrix, right? You've seen the matrix? Yes. So the screens that they see in the matrix, that's machine code. That's the machine world. Computers aren't smart, but they actually execute machine code. They don't execute print. Print is for us, that's nice. They execute things like A9 to load the A register. Assembly language is one step above that. And that's actually where I started. Python's much nicer. So I'll show you some other stuff just to, you know, that old thing. Back when we had that little cranks on our computers to keep them going. All right, see you guys Tuesday, if not before.